Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the fourth session of Typographics 21, 2021, the festival for people who use type. I'm Barbara Glauber, a Cooper Union faculty member and a typographics conference advisor. The remarkable team at Cooper Union have produced this festival for seven years. And this time we're taking advantage of our collective familiarity with the online format and going global with 11 guest curators sharing design perspectives in 10 sessions over the span of five weeks. Please check our website, 2021.typographics.com for the schedule and more information. Today's event is curated by Troy Linster, who has invited three designers from the South Pacific to share their work with us. Before I introduce Troy, we would like to share some special typographic animations made by our sponsors specifically for this year's online conference. Enjoy. I'm delighted to introduce today's curator, Troy Linster, an Australian typeface designer based in New York City. He holds a master's degree in typeface design from the Type and Media Program at the Royal Academy of Art, KABK, in The Hague, and a postgraduate certificate in typeface design from the Type at Cooper Program. From 2014 to 2021, Troy was a full-time typeface designer at the Heffler & Company Type Foundry, located right down the hall from my studio and where we would run into each other at the elevators. His projects include gorgeously crafted typefaces such as Decimal, Aristyle, the Ringside Superfamily, Isotype, and Cesium. Troy has accumulated over 10 years of typeface design experience and has been teaching the Principles of Typeface Design course at Cooper Union since 2016. I'll turn it over to you now, Troy. 
Thank you, Barbara. Nice to see you. And hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Typographics uh, 2021. And thank you to Typographics for inviting me to curate uh, the three speakers we have for you today from Down Under. Just a quick reminder to ask your questions in the Q&A window, and we'll try and respond after each presentation. My choice of speakers today was based on their work, not just on the page, but how they're using their type design, uh, sorry, type and their design skills off the page. They're using type in the environment through murals, signage and art installations. And they're connecting and promoting the cultural heritage of their country, uplifting their fellow designers and fighting for change. Today, we'll be doing a little bit of time travel into the future, starting with an early visit uh, to Surabaya, Indonesia, where it's 6 a.m. tomorrow for the, those of us on uh, the other side of the world. I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker today, Ferry Fatoni. Ferry is a calligrapher and graphic designer from Surabaya. He graduated from Surabaya State University, majoring in art education and focusing on fi fine arts. Barry has participated in various lettering competitions and art exhibitions. He's also a founder of Subletter, which is one of the largest lettering and calligraphy communities in Surabaya. Good morning, Ferry, and apologies for getting you up so early. Uh, selamat pagi, Mas Ferry. Sorry, udah bangunin begitu pagi. Tidak masalah. Saya tidak no tidur hari ini. <laughs> oh, uh, he's, he didn't sleep today. <laughs> Please go ahead when you're ready, Ferry. Yeah, mulai okay. kalau Okay. Hello everyone. Uh before I start my presentation, I want to thank to my friends, Adin Punarta, and of course, especially Troy, for giving me this opportunity and very pleasure to participate in this event. And yes, you all, you all guys already know me, Troy, as uh, Troy said before, right? I'm a Ferry Fatoni from Indonesia, and I love doing lettering and especially calligraphy. I took the title of this presentation, uh, The Construction of Japanese Script, uh, with subtitle, Reviving Japanese Script as a Subject Matter in in creating of contemporary calligraphy works. Why I take Japanese script? Uh, why not Arabic or Latin or Russian? Yes, of course. My main reason is that I was born and grew up in Java Island, precisely in Surabaya city. I go on to right? <laughs> okay. Why well, here I took a word of reviving. Okay, before I, I answer it, let me tell you a little about Japanese script. So Japanese script or well known as Honochoroko is one of the traditional Indonesian script that developed in the Java Island. Japanese script actually used to write Japanese, but uh, in its development, it can also use to write other language, such English, sure it can, but also need Jasmine. And historically, this Japanese script has been actively used in literary works and daily writing of Japanese people since in the middle 15 centuries until middle 20 centuries, which was gradually replaced by Latin letters. I gave the example of Japanese scripts in use of literary works. On the left one is a piece of 
content from Celarasa Literary Works. It's printed oh. in... Jadi yang sebelah kiri itu uh, printingan dari Serat Celarasa di tahun 1984. It's in Chen and 1984. The middle one is Babat Tuban Literary Works from Tan Khon Sui printed in 1936. And the red one is a Kejauan Magazine edition 65 printed in 1933. And, and in nowadays, the use of Japanese script is increasingly rarely used. And it can even be said that it's no longer used. And the use of Japanese script nowadays are become a part of lesson in elementary school and several junior junior high school in Java. And other use of Japanese script now are more just a uh, symbolic such as being used on school signboard, government office signboard, street name, and many others. That's why I called my work is or reviving Japanese script. This is example of Japanese script and the result of my deconstruction. The upper part with Latin letters inside is the original Japanese script and the bottom one is my deconstruction works. I mentioned mentioned before that Chevron script is well known as Anacaraka or Honocoroko because the order of reading or pronunciations from ho to no to cho ro ko like this. And actually in Japanese script it also has meaning but I think I will skip it for now because it will be a long story to tell that. This also continuation of the previous slide. Actually, when I doing the deck construction of Japanese script, it's not really stuck with that what I met here. So this is just a big visual of it. Because in my process of creating artworks, is I also use some innovation with consider a harmony, repetition, and also layout. These two work. The left one is Honocharoko one, and the right one is Honocharoko two. I created these two work in in 2016. I really like these two works because for me these two artworks are very special because they are my first and second artworks using the construction of Japanese script. And in these two works, I used random Japanese scripts composition and exploration. I didn't write any words. I just wrote Japanese script with each other repeatedly until it become like this. In the left one, I made a circular composition which I filled with the construction of Japanese script. And in the right one, I tried to make composition in of circles and square which I filled with Japanese script. This work with the title, The Gold One. I make an analog that the Japanese script is a cultural heritage that has existed for a long time, but that 
but that is what makes this Japanese script as a uh, very valuable. I made this work when there was a street competition, a co-working space in my city. And I am grateful that this work was able to get first place at that time. The title of this work is Awal Akhir, or in English, the beginning and the end. The purpose of this work is that between the beginning and the end, there must be a process or progress. And this process is the most decisive, whether what we start with and with achievement or a ground without any achievement means, yeah, you just end like this. In this artwork, I create this work as an exploration of the layout using random Japanese script. In this work, I use acrylic paint as a background and alcohol-based paint for the writing part of the deconstruction of Japanese script. I made this artwork in 2016. This work is titled with alam, or in English means nature. I took the blue color here, inspired by the color of the sea, because at that time, I happened to be after a vacation with my best friends, enjoying the beauty of nature, starting from the forest, beach, and mountain climbing. And then this artwork happened. Every time I see this work with Title Strange Magic. I always remember one of the animated film about the story of romance be between insect and elves, which has the same title of it. This work is a mark for my future work inspiration. That from now, my artwork mostly inspired by my romance life. In this work, strange magic, I mean is love. Love is a happiness. Love is a beauty. Love is a pleasure. But behind it, behind it is also very dangerous. If you have a sense of love for wrong people. That's why I gave this work the title strange magic. And I I mean, strength magic is love. This artworks have a title, Sateru, or in English means strife. In this case, I made this work in the condition of my romantic life, which very, very often experiences false problems. False problems here means that all the problems that actually can be passed can be passed but as if there were no problem before in this artworks i use word setteru and write it in the media repeatedly this works uh, have a title kacau or in English means chaos. The more I come here, I feel and consciously make this a construction of Japanese script. Circumstances as well as a means of emotional outbursts that I experienced, especially in the romantic life that I mentioned earlier.
this artwork, I thought I made it in a size that are quite small than usual, but it, but in the process, it takes a long time because here I made it using a small brush. In this work, I really enjoy the process of each line that I make until each layout is completely filled with the construction of Japanese script. I made it on 2017. 2017. Anchi anchi pucho ing re means resting on the tip of thorn. In this work, I collaborate with my college friends who likes fashion design. His name is Vinda Delita. I very like this artwork because I have opportunity to try, to try my works, the construction of Japanese script applied on fashion design. And for this artworks, I also very happy because it had opportunity to participate on fashion show runway, especially the left one with a black cap. Elena, that's how my best friends and I named my car. In this work, I create with a permanent marker, which reads, Elena, keberuntungan bersamamu. Or in English means, Elena, let's be with you. This artwork also very special for me because I have opportunity to create my deconstruction of Japanese script using another unique media. Time to change this artwork I create using a metallic acrylic paint on canvas. I made this work as a final project for my focusing fine art lesson in college. I inspired from my point of view where life is actually simple. Do, do what should be done according to your own will. Life is only once. Make your life as free as possible, positive, and most importantly, useful for those around you. That's it. The deep I met this artwork with acrylic paint and spray paint on a circular canvas measuring 120 centimeter in diameter. In this work, I try to play with color gradation that can give a deep impression. The process of create gradation of this artwork is the first I create the center color first and then I add white paint little by little on every circle I made until the outer circle become white color. In this work, I take the word ngala, which is in English is give in, and the center one is reads babbler, and the right one reads sabar, which in English is patience. 
I use contrasting colors of blue and red in this artworks, which I analogize as a bipolar mood condition that sometimes goes up and goes down, goes up and goes down in a short time, just like that. Uh, this one, I made this work in a uh, memory of one of my teachers who really liked my work. I cannot say much about this artwork. I hope he likes my prison. Rest in peace, Mr. Dodi. I create this artwork with aluminum plate media. The process of making this work is that first I made a dig digital vector and then I printed it on the cutting sticker. Then I put a sticker on the aluminum plate. After that, I soak the aluminum which I have given a sticker to the hydrochloride liquid. And this process is called etching. The part that covered with sticker will remain smooth and shiny, but the part that is not covered will be eroded deep. I always enthusiast when I have a opportunity to create my work of the construction of Japanese script on another media just like this. I made this work with digital. This is my latest work I made. And the, le the left one means aku orep or in English means I still live. This work I made after a long time not creating my, my work on my Instagram account because I was so bad busy with my work. And the and the left one and the right one reads Susa Senang Dilakoni, which is mean that in life, how hard life it is, or how easy life it is, we must go on. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoy my presentation. Thanks for having me in and for a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ferry. That's uh, beautiful work. Uh, it's really exciting to see the growing interest in uh, Javanese script and how it's being used in contemporary ways. Um, I, it seems you've painted on many surfaces, um, including Helena. I'm curious what your favorite material is to work on. Yep. I'm not sure whether we have our translator. Let me try. Okay. Oh yes. Thank you, Leonardo. Oh, uh, jadi Mas Troy bilang, um, kamu udah coba uh, menggunakan banyak media. Uh, can Can you repeat the uh, the questions, please? Yeah, I was just curious um, what uh, Ferry's favorite material is to work on. I see, um, you know, he's working on many surfaces, including his car, Helena, which I love. Mm. Um, does he have a favorite uh, material to work on? Kamu punya uh, material favorit gak dalam, dalam uh, buat um, artwork ini? Kalau media... Media favorit. Yeah. Uh, media yang mana? Uh, yang favorit tetap Helena. Oh, his favorite is Helena. Okay, cool. Oops, yeah. I think that's one of my favorites too. I, I'm a big fan of the. Favoritnya juga, of Helena. 
big fan of the the fabric as well. Um, yeah, suka fabricnya. Does Barry want to tell us a little bit about uh, subletter? Bisa dikasih tahu tentang sublena? Uh, sub, sublena. Subletter? Subletter, ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Subletter is a, um, adalah komunitas lettering dan kaligrafi yang berbasis di Surabaya. Subletter itu uh, subletter is a uh, lettering community in Surabaya. Uh, bisa ada lagi nggak? Bagaimana menaungi para anak muda yang suka dan hobi dalam kaligrafi dan lettering? Uh, he's a uh, he's a uh, grouping pe- people uh, like usually. Uh, youngsters who really love uh, calligraphy and lettering. Khususnya di Surabaya. Yeah, but but mostly in Surabaya. Fantastic, and I think you can um, take a look at that on Instagram at sub dot letter. Is that right? Yeah, bisa dilihat di uh, linknya uh, sub letter. Sub dot letter. Sub dot letter, sub dot letter. Great, thank you so much, Ferry. It was great to have you. Uh, before we go into our next presenter, we would like to share with you a few short typographic animations made by our sponsors, specifically for this year's conference. We will have Catherine Griffiths present right after this. And he wakes up and his arm is doing the thing uh, that's it's kind of glowing whenever he turns it on. So I think he finally like unlocked a hundred. Okay, so now we're going to head down to New Zealand, the land of the long white cloud. I'd like to introduce to you Catherine Griffiths. Catherine is a typographer, designer, artist, curator, educator, writer, publisher, activist, and feminist. Improvisation is critical to her practice, which moves between graphic design, self-publishing, and commissioned art installations in public and private spaces, 
architectural and landscape. Her projects include the Wellington Riders Walk, a series of concrete text sculptures, the curation and co-organization of Typeshed 11 in 2009, where I first met Catherine. She also runs the compact typographic workshop series at her studio located in the rainforest in Curry Curry, and the ongoing BAL series, including AEIOU, Constructed Projected Typo Janshi 2015, and Lightweight O. Three years ago, Catherine protested against gender and cultural inequities in design. She founded the platform Designers Speak Up and curated a poster project and exhibition Hiku, present tense, Wahini Toy Ataroa. In 2019, saw her first survey show, Catherine Griffith's Solo in Space, which was in Shanghai. She is also exhibited in New Zealand, Chile, France, USA, and Korea. Kiora Catherine. Tenakwe, Troy. Please go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Um, yes, um, kia ora everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here, um, Troy, and, and the cura curatorial team. It's an honour to be amongst this year's programme. And um, yeah, it's um, quite a lot of um, nerves happening here, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, anyway, let's um, let's go. So this first slide uh, is something which I wanted to share, being uh, my studio space, which of course is not red, um, but it's set up for one of my workshop series or typographic workshop series, and um, and I wanted to include this because my space kind of makes its way into other projects and we'll come to those over, um, over the, the, the session. But uh, during one of the workshops, um, and it was number four with uh, Tino Grass, um, one of the participants, Matthew Galloway, uh, who's an educator and designer, uh, he heard me say to everyone, you will need both hands to walk. And so he decided to use, use these words in his type of typographic poster that day. And you can see him here on the right, uh, uh, projecting his sketch onto the wall and then um, making it into a, a large scale poster. But I guess the thing is, is that um, those words, which act the highlight, or which rather highlight uh, the act of making, of doing, and and it's this very thing, this constructing, building, assembling, doing the mahi, uh, doing the work, uh, which is part of my process and way of being. And this is an image from uh, Taiwo Janshi 2015, where I'm installing the, the fourth in, in my bow series. Um, but we'll come to that later. And I, th I think the thing is, it's just figuring out how to make what is already forming in my mind in response to a condition, a space, a material, a remark, whatever that may be. So this image here, um, I've included it because well, I want to move straight into the writer's walk, the Wellington writer's walk, which was my first large scale public work. And this is going back 20 years, almost to the, to the year, I think. Um, when I was actually building this work, oh, of course, with others. Um, and it was the Wellington Writers' Walk, a series of large-scale concrete text sculptures. And um, here I am making, so um, working with uh, typesetting, really, on a, on a grand scale. So, um, and these are some of the concrete cast letters. Um, yeah, and, and you can see here just the activity, the physical activity and engagement with um, type or typography, lettering, 
I'm a type user, um, less so a type designer, so a typographer, if you like, although I have um, constructed some type forms and into an alphabet of sorts, unpublished or semi-published. But let's just run through these 15 text sculptures, um, which were made in response to a brief that called for A4 sized bronze plaques to be set into the ground in the civic square. And I think this is the thing, taking a wander with the brief is part of my process. It's a measure of my disposition ever since I can remember. Um, and this talk is probably another one of those in a sense. Um, I'll just move something there. Uh, so position in places unexpected on the rocks, um, you know, as if detritus washed up on the sea, um, washed ashore rather, cantilevered, floating or hung along the city's waterfront. And um, really, I guess they're a true celebration of some of our honored writers and poets, of course, not all. Um, but at the time, uh, the late architect Ian Athfield encouraged me in a council meeting, and I was like early 30s at this time, so I was young and I had the energy um, to go bigger with works that I thought were already large scale. So I was working in about a meter dimension or so, and these ended up being, in fact, this is um, a meter square, this one, but they, some of them were 2.5 meters long. But his remark opened the door wide, I guess, and I literally leapt off the printed page and into the landscape with this project. And it was international. Um, so, you know, that's where I, my trajectory sort of went in that, in that direction. And as um, painter, poet, and curator Gregory O'Brien later wrote um, for, for Art New Zealand magazine uh, in, in an article titled Body, Mind, Somehow, the text art of Catherine Griffiths, he, he said, the placement of one reminds me of a dropped bus ticket. And that, that really resonates. Um, and I'm going to move into a, a project, another project. But the thing is, is that the act of collecting a fascination with language and a tendency to improvise in order to make or make do um, play a crucial role in my work. So for 10 years, I collected phone numbers from the streets of Paris. Um, this is in the 2000s. And you'll know these, um, they're tiny, tiny paper tear off tabs, advertising piano lessons, cleaning services, a masseuse, a plumber, and they're often taped to down pipes and lampposts, usually at eye level, fluttering in the breeze or competing on a notice board in the lavery laundry. They're handwritten. Um, in the early days, they were mostly handwritten, but over the course of the 10 years, they were um, often and mostly um, typed on the computer. So I saw this sort of shift in my collecting of what um, was being rendered. And the, the thing is, you only have to dial that number found in a public space to enter a whole other world, and that's someone else's private life. I found this fascinating. Um, and I know this is um, digressing slightly, but we did say that we'd be deviating here and there. Um, the keyhole uh, becomes a motif for that glimpse into another world, and it's symbolic of that entry point. By peering through, you can only see what is framed by that shape. And on the, the and here we see the scale. Um, uh, sorry, I'll come back to it. But scaling and rescaling to alter context and meaning is something that I explore a lot in my work. Um, here the, you, you can see the, the seven keyhole rugs that I ended up making. Um, they're about uh, 2.4 meters length, in length or high. Um, but the thing is, is that act of taking small and fragile objects from the street and to return them to the domestic landscape in the form of a rug or a book on a table, um, in this case, um, an installation in Chile, um, in Valparaiso, where I was invited to uh, participate in a group show on Alzheimer's. So um, this work was about memory, loss of memory, um, and was titled Memento Motif. So 
part of the, the installation was a film, um, which I made and I won't show you here, but it was another collection of moving image um, that I made tiny motifs in the sky, the formations that occur, um, the low resolution. And, oops, um, okay, so enlarged onto the wall until they're so overblown, they abstract. And again, Greg O'Brien wrote about this, the language fragment embedded in the sky. Um, these words sort of sit with me uh, as observations on what I'm doing or um, making. Um, it's an audience response to, to my work. So we might move on a little quickly through here, but the phone book which I made, which you can see sitting on this table here, it's a tiny book, preserves the fragment, the memento, the collected telephone numbers, the handwritten, the typed, um, and it assists in remembering in the same way that the sound of the Jets film elicits a certain me memory or feeling for the viewer um, who then brings their own def definition to the work. So again, interactive. Um, and th these are important elements in my thinking and making as a typographer, designer, artist, whatever, writer, activist, educator, partner, I'm stepmother of five, and then, and then their own five, um, who are all scattered about the world. And being Pākehā, um, with shared English and Māori whakapapa, and this drawing here um, is a work I made. It's um, titled A Whakapapa, Two Lines of Women, an installation drawing. And I made it in 2016, and it was part of a group exhibition titled All Lines Converge, um, held at the Gavit Brewster in New Plymouth here in Aotearoa. But there's no, no pause or separation. Each is interwoven, has a place, is meaningful. These, these elements that I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, being Pākehā here, um, fifth generation, um, the spaces are not always, um, you know, uh, there are complexities and um, we must navigate these spaces. But also, you know, there's a kaupapa, a reason for being and a plan. And I think um, the work that I do um, works to that somewhat. Um, as a practitioner, I move across the disciplines with a certain freedom, untethered, I guess, sometimes. Um, unskilled at other times, mostly, um, I would say, uh, in areas, try my hand at anything, with a willingness to take the risk, um, stepping into uncharted territory. And I guess I've always felt the urge to stand up for what I believe in. And this takes us to um, a series of posters that um, Troy was very keen for me to talk about. So I'm, I've thrown them in here um, at the risk of running out of time for uh, 20 minutes. But this is the Brexit series, process series of posters. And the thing is, I hold a British passport as well as a New Zealand passport because I was born during my parents' overseas experience um, in the 1960s. And I came here when I was less than one year old, um, but I'm born to uh, New Zealand parents. Um, and I guess the thing is when uh, Brexit happened, it lodged in my mind enough to, to produce a series of posters prompted by an image on Twitter by Hamish Muir um, in the UK, who said, or his tw tw tweet said, and I think he actually, yeah, he, he posted the image, the past or the futura, and it was typeset in futura. So this was my immediate response, this previous image an accident's grotesque waiting to happen. So these, these are type uh, wordplay posters, typographic, um, they're type specimens, if you like. And they were made in response to what was happening in the news. So um, you can see here some takes on uh, some familiar rhymes and comments around uh, typefaces. Um, and then of course, ending with um, into the eye of the maelstrom and this is set in Chris Sowsby's uh, typeface. And of course it persists um, with alarming consequences as we know. Um, so while we're here, uh, another thing that I did in 2018 um, 
was protest a uh, systemic gender and actually cultural imbalance, but at this point it was, it was gender focused. Um, represented by our female run governing body in the design industry. And for the past two decades, the Designers Institute of New Zealand has awarded its top accolade, the black pin, 43 times, 40 to men, three to women. And uh, one of whom is, is the CEO of the Institute herself. Um, but you can see here the visualization of that information here. Um, they announced the jury for the awards, um, nine conveners of juries to judge the nine main categories and various subcategories, eight men, one women. So this is in 2018. Um, of the jurors and conveners combined, 46 men, 15 women, the jury for the value of design award was made up of men only. So this really kind of got things moving. Um, so at this point, I decided to make the protest. And again, in the guise of a, a type specimen uh, poster, if you like. Um, and then, um, and I should mention that, uh, of course, the most important thing about this is, is that all of the content was provided by the Designers Institute on the Best Awards website. They, the color purple, I mean, go figure. Um, and then the typeface untitled Sans um, by Chris. So it was um, really nice to be able to sort of use the content without um, and the statistics. So we're all sitting there. Um, and so then out of that, uh, uh, to kickstart a korero or a conversation um, available to everyone, um, several of us with the appetite, um, and that included uh, my, one of my stepdaughters, Alice Conyu, and her publishing um, co cohort, Katie Kerr, set up Designers Speak Up as a platform to involve the entire design community to help the Institute and wider, community, uh, wider industry be continually aware of historic and real-time issues and concerns. So let's um, move on because this could take up a long time. Um, we organized a protest, um, Action 43, with the support of Auckland Feminist Action Group outside the awards on the night. Um, it coincided with the 125th anniversary of women's suffrage, which was hilarious. And that night, uh, the John Britton Black Pin was awarded um, again, and the numbers went up to 42.3. So nothing shifted, although it has since. Um, and the day following our protest, one of New Zealand's pioneering suffragists was acknowledged and celebrated. 125 years after women here won the right to vote. And that person was um, my great great grandmother, Marianne Muller, ex Griffiths, um, because she was divorced. And she had written an appeal to the men of New Zealand under the pseudonym Femina, because her husband, her second husband, didn't approve. And she was fighting for the rights of women, divorcees, to have land rights and ownership of property and so on. Um, how long, she asked, are women to remain a wholly unrepresented body of the people? So that was in 1869. But let's move on. And she would have um, been probably quite happy to find that her one of her descendants, um, granddaughters down the line, was um, working in the space. We set up a that, that, that same day, actually, we launched the design, uh, the directory of women and non-binary designers. Um, uh, and um, we won't linger here, but, um, you know, we, we became really active in the space. And of course, it's all voluntary. So it was all coming out of our own time. And, uh, and then we made a poster call to uh, designers, um, women, non-binary, um, and uh, female identifying just to respond to um, our call and make a poster to a set series of conditions around any social, political uh, or cultural issue that they felt strongly about just so we could look at what the landscape of, of these designers would be in this window of time. And, um, and the, the project went over about six to nine months and toured as we Built, we collected um, posters and contributions over that time. Uh, and I think here we can possibly see, um, if it's not too glitchy, um, just 
over 100 posters, submissions in writing. Uh, there were texts um, from people who, who took part and um, the project moved around Aotearoa to the small centres actually and some large ones. Um, a lot of writing was, was um, presented and, um, and those are our um, work, works list sheets. Um, but I'm going to move on to um, the things that we were meant to be talking about in the first place. And um, as you can see, I've, I've, I'm fascinated by language, sound, um, wordplay, layers of meaning and interpretation. And um, it was on the cusp of Type 11, which is um, a typography symposium, uh, which I co-organised and curated with Simone Wolf here in um, Aotearoa. And um, it was where I first met Troy. So it's back in 2009, and I made my first work kind of as an antidote to all that organizing, so I understand what type of graphics are going through. Um, and the work was um, AEIOU, a typo sound installation. And here, just going back to that making, um, you know, we see the, the chalk drawings on the floor as the pattern uh, or pattern making. Um, uh, set to work from. So these were built and rolled by hand. Um, the work constructs five vowels and steel rod and lightly stacks them five metres on a first level terrace in Poneke in um, Wellington. And um, it inserts between a new structure and an old structure. It offers a sense of privacy to the residents on the apartment side but speaks to the street on the other. And this is an improvisation where the idea and materi materiality are, are really in tune. So a live improvisation comes with the public. People are compelled to respond out loud as they try to make out the forms until the letters finally come together in sequence. And this is when I started recording um, people's responses. So here we hear someone who saw this work not on the street, but actually saw the image and she... A -E -I -O -U. Um, so that was, um, I'll say it again. A -E -I -O -U. So language, um, that's Catherine Zask, uh, designer, artist in Paris. Um, and after that, uh, I collected sounds for a long time and made it into a soundtrack. But here you can see the form uh, working. One person read, I love you. They didn't read R -E -E -O -U or or a E I O U. Um, they read I, I Love You and in, in, into the work. So it's this incidental participation by the audience which takes um, takes us to um, another work in this series and uh, construction, uh, sorry, uh, constructed projected. Um, this is a semi autobiographical work and it's the fourth iteration in the series and I made it for Taiko Janchi in 2015. Um, the Korean Typography BNI. And it was, um, the theme was City and Typography. Um, this is really a continuation of my language. The film is central to the work. So there's a film projected into the space. Um, it's central to the work, it's titled I, and it deals with um, the vertical space between the up and down of above and below. So um, I is also, the middle letter of the five vowels in the English language. Um, I think we can play a little bit. And this is um, my youngest boy, um, or our youngest, um, and he's he's uh, dancing in the space. We film this and. and Back, back box of France. He's um, yeah. So um, just a little snippet there. You can watch the full length film um, at some at your leisure in high def. Um, but I guess it's it's really a continuation of my language in that sense. Um, let's just jump back the race through here. Um, 
image and sound projects into the space as a running stream of consciousness. Um, and you know, the jets, the film The Jets feature in here, as do as does the soundtrack from the vowel sounds recorded and collected. Um, there's a little intervention here. So again, participation in the space, um, walking through and becoming part of that, um, part of the, the performance, I guess. And other projects and modes of construction are referenced. So uh, a timber A, oops, um, uh, the timber form, which you will have seen, um, sheets of plywood from my studio walls, um, the 15 rods of a disassembled E from that first um, construction of steel rod that you saw, um, reflective paper, the O on the floor, and um, barrier tape as a sideways U kind of improvised on the spot. Um, lightweight O, uh, this is a work that's hanging in, uh, uh, it's suspended above O'Connell Street um, in downtown Tamaki Makoto, Auckland near where I live. It's a mirror-faced brass back object and the title of the work riffs of reflection, suspension, typography through materiality, movement and proportion, making a direct nod to the lightweight version of a letter form uh, in, in proportion. Um, it's 2.4 meters and it gently pivots, offering uh, its natural and built surroundings back to the viewer through light and reflection, um, catching the eye close up and at a distance. And um, again, it, the viewer is encouraged to observe the above and the below and consider the space between. It brings attention to the sky framed by the built environment and the earth beneath. And um, yeah, we'll just jump on. So th these are some drawings, again, in a series of prints um, scale, you can see the scale of the work. Um, how are we doing for time? I, sure. Um, this leads uh, into a large scale artwork, um, Kaleidoscape, which is another work. Um, and I want to show this because um, it again. It's a composition for a seven meter high grid of glass panels. It was a, a commission with um, Atfield Architects. And as you'll have seen, um, the, these vowel based works really explore the abstraction of letter shapes. So line, curve, circle, and the speech sounds that they elicit. So I'm just going to jump in here. Um, there's the Here's the drawing. Uh, you can see the scale, um, an atrium space. And the work is probably a more painterly rendition. In this case, a collision of vowel sounds, a language or sound landscape is how um, I, I approach this work. And while it's a drawing, it's a graphic improvisation, a, a deconstruction, it's disruptive um, and reads, reads in a different way, a different sounding. And you can see um, uh, references to letters. There's an underlying grid uh, system that's based on a typeface, Muir McNeil's two point, um, which also presents itself in the U boldly. Um, a hint of their typeface panopticon is visible on the E. The rest um, are computers default dash and slash lines, danger tape pattern, making reference to other works in the series. So there's this drawing of sound from another work. Um, and this just leads, um, leads us to, we're, we're nearly towards the end here. Um, in 2017, I presented a work titled Workspace. So again, going back to this space I'm in and somehow presenting pieces or fragments of my work um, in Shanghai um, at uh, uh, an exhibition. It was a group show. And it was actually where I met Sean, who you're going to hear, hear from next. Um, but also, um, I should say that this is a very generous invitation that came through uh, Joie Duan, designer, who um, was Melbourne and Shanghai. 
And um, he first heard me speak in Melbourne and then we encountered him um, when he joined the Porto Design Summer School. Um, it looks like we um, should finish up, but um, you can see here how, how the, uh, the project um, has ended. That's uh, beside Massa's um, large scale poster works on the wall. So I'll flick through and end um, here. So Nami Him Nui. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Catherine. Your talents are so broad, it's very inspiring. I remember walking down to the Wellington waterfront for the first time and seeing those uh, concrete typography sculptures, they really gave me goosebumps. I'm wondering, you know, is there an aging process going on with those sculptures now that tie them into the environment more over time? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that um, has always been part of uh, that work is that they, they are to just age and become part of that uh, environment. So yes, they have. And, um, and you can see that, that time in them. Um, I continue to make repairs. Bruce, uh, my husband helps me and we, we go down and replace letters. So they look kind of mottled with newer letters and older letters, but on the whole, they, they, they're 20 years on and they, they're um, in fine fettle. We're, we're actually rebuilding one uh, uh, over the next couple of months, um, which actually, uh, yeah, it's, an, it's a live project. So that's lovely. <laughs> Um, Acting's important. You mentioned um, your husband, Bruce Conyu, the photographer. You recently finished a book uh, with him. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project? Oh, Troy. Um, okay, very quickly. So I deliberately didn't show books in this talk because that's a whole other talk. Um, but Bruce, uh, it's a project of his. He's a photographer, artist in his own right. Um, I assist him. Uh, through typography and my um, skills that I can bring to the project. But he is very much someone who, who, pump, who in his photographic projects, the book is the art object, the published outcome, the um, complete being. And the latest book is called A Vocabulary. It, um, it deals with uh, close-ups of texts, um, edited through the camera lens, not on screen or anywhere later. As seen through the camera, Bruce um, has gone on to look in detail at the language uh, used uh, during the time of the New Zealand wars, col colonials, uh, the colonization rather, um, the wars between the British and Māori. And, um, and it's pretty intense uh, and the work is there to be read uh, through the images, um, but there's an extensive captioning that goes with them and acknowledges everybody involved in those um, in those battles from uh, Māori, so um, iwi, hapu um, individuals, and then um, British as well. And it's um, pretty. Um, it's a very emotional and uh, intense body of work uh, for both Māori and Pākehā. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was uh, fantastic. Okay. So right I'm now sure. we're going to um, show you a few more typographic animations from our sponsors that were made uh, for this year's conference. And then next up, we'll have uh, Sean Hogan uh, do his presentation.
get a con in your inbox every single month. Quantum no more. Future Future Future. Oh. We've got talk fonts. We've got pointy fonts. You want a soft font? We got it. We got fonts that'll make you scream. We got fonts that'll make you dance. We got fonts that'll make you say whoa, 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 whoa. We've got fancy fonts and groovy fonts and many more. Get them all on Future Fonts. Okay, thanks so much to our sponsors there. Now we're going to cross over to my home country, Australia, and uh, speak with graphic designer and artist Sean Hogan in Melbourne, Victoria. Sean is the director of his studio, Trampoline. He's worked with clients including Apple Music, The New York Times, and Wired Magazine. Since 2010, he's been the art director and designer of RMIT's Journal of Landscape Architecture at Cork Curb. Sean has won awards across major design institutions in Australia, including the Australian Graphic Design Association, the Royal Australian Institute of Architects, and the Australian Institute of Landscape Architecture. He's been invited as a contributor to the San Francisco Design Week, Melbourne Design Week, and the Shanghai Visual Art and Design Exhibition. In 2020, a collection of his digital artworks were published and presented at the Shanghai Art and Book Fair in a large poster called, a poster book called Sean Hogan, 30 Works, 2014 to 2020. G'day, Sean, how are you doing? Good, Troy. How are you, mate? Good, thank you. Take it away when you're ready. No worries. Thank you, Troy. Uh, firstly, I'd like to begin this talk by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I present today. I'd also like to pay respect to the elders, both past, present and emerging of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. So thanks for joining me on this talk. Uh, as Troy mentioned, my name is Sean Hogan and uh, today I'm here to talk about a recent book I designed called Signature. Signature recently won an Australian Design Award, uh, Australian, uh, Australian Graphic Design Award, uh, and is a book I'm incredibly proud of. But before we have a look at Signature, I'd like to show you some examples of my work and talk a bit about the research and references I use to design Signature. So for the past 25 years, I've run a small art and design studio, Trampoline, here in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia. Now I'm going to flip through these slides quite quickly as they are just here to give you examples of some of my work and give you an idea of how and who I design for. These slides are in no particular order. In my time as a designer, I've been able to combine a commercial and research led practice that enjoys blurring the processes and visual language of art and design. I've been fortunate to build a client base which includes universities, research labs and design studios predominantly in the fields of art, music, architecture, and cultural programming. As you can see from these slides, I'm really interested in what I should call the ambiguity of design. That is, I like to, desi I like to design so that the viewer has to do some work, 
where perhaps communication is a little open-ended, open for interpretation. I like work that has an element of mystery and is not so literal. I find this such an interesting idea, an interesting area in design to explore, as so often graphic design is about the idea of direct and clear communication, especially if you're working for a commercial client. And this idea runs in the opposite direction to that. I like design to be conceptually grounded and have meaning. This theory, if you want to call it that, has led me to investigate and research formal aspects of design, such as color theory, geometries, and typography, and explore the power that these elements have to communicate an idea. It's about creating visual, stimu visual stimuli, reducing ideas down to their simplest form, and it's amazing how much our eyes can absorb information uh, without having to read literally what the work is about. I find that this direction of design allows for more engagement with the work as it's not often obvious what the work is about. It's often more memorable and it also works greater on an emotional level. What may appear as simple is often conceptually rich and layered. The architect Mies van der Rohe said less is more. And for me, this is true, more intrigue, more interpretation, more engagement. So a large part of my studio practice is to allow myself time and space to develop my own artworks and ideas free of external constraints. This research runs parallel to my design work and for me is a necessary extension to my creative practice. My design and art practices not only work together, they inform each other. I've now been exhibiting these works in galleries for the past few years and they have taken the form of paintings, publications, prints and sculptures. So please keep this in mind. Uh, please keep in mind my ideas about ambiguity, as you will see when I talk about the design of the book signature, how this approach has influenced the design. Now, before I get on to discussing signature, I just want to give you a brief introduction to my work with the writer and poet Paul Carter. So here's a little bit about Paul. Paul's a cultural historian and writer. He has spent over 30 years exploring connections between landscape, place, storytelling and overlaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. In the early 1990s, he began to collaborate with designers and artists to explore how storytelling offers a process of cultural reimagining that is the remaking of place. So I first met Paul on the Federation Square project. And Federation Square was a civic project to build a new cultural heart and city square in Melbourne. One of my jobs uh, was to work with the chosen artists to help realize their vision. So I ended up working with Paul and designing a typeface for his work called Niram New that would be sandblasted into the sandstone that made up the plaza. I've worked with Paul now on several jobs over the past 20 years. And here's, a, here's another example uh, of our work for another cultural hub recently opened in, in Perth. So this artwork is called Passenger and the font I designed was inspired by the story of um, a younger woman, an indigenous woman called Fanny Bulbuck, who in opposition to the growth of the colonial town would walk with a dig digging stick through the town, not altering her path, sometimes knocking down doors and walking through buildings. So here in the font, you can see her digging stick, which is donated, denoted by the circle. It was also stipulated that the font be a stencil font so it could easily be cut into the material of the facades. So what is Signature? Signature is a book that collects eight site specific inscriptions by Paul Carter, similar to the one that I showed you just at Federation Square. The inscriptions are poetic compositions arising from the stories and histories embedded in each site's cultural and environmental history. They're about Australia's Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, colonisation and relationships with the land and place. So where do you start with research? As a starting point, we wrote a few things that we thought were of interest to our project. Some things that we thought might give us some ideas on direction. Now numbers five and six here are of special interest. Paul always saw his writing as performance pieces. That is, they are written to be said out loud. So it was in the back of our heads as to how we could potentially make this happen. So out of researching this list, a few things started to emerge that we thought were of interest to us 
and that we could, we could use as starting points for the designs. And the first one was Scriptio Continua. Uh, Scriptio Continua is a style of writing without spaces or other marks between the words or sentences. Classical Greek and late classical Latin both employed Scriptio Continua as the norm. Paul often writes in Scriptio Continua style, and here is an example of his writing. And as you can see, it's not entirely that easy to read. Later on, Greek and Latin inscriptions used devices as word dividers to separate words in sentences. And these are known as interpunks. So just keep that in mind because I'll get to that a little bit later. Second of all, we looked at illuminated manuscripts. An illuminated manuscript is a really early form of what we'd call a book and is a manuscript in which the text is supplemented with decorations such as initials, borders, and miniature illustrations. What was of interest to us was the layouts on the page, how they use Scriptio Continua and the marks made by the use of the early writing implements like the reed pen and the quill feather, which create this beautiful black letter typography. We we're also particularly fond of the use of rubrics, now, for those that you don't know, a rubric is a word or section of text that is traditionally written or printed in red ink for emphasis. Thirdly, we looked at concrete poetry. We're interested in how poetry and typography had coexisted in the past. Concrete poetry is the arrangement of linguistic elements in which the typographical effect is more important in conveying meaning than verbal significance. These are some examples of the experimental, contemporary and playful ways in which artists and designers started to combine typography and poetry. There, there's a lot of examples uh, of this online and I encourage you to have a look if you're interested. Some of the main proponents of this kind of works are Malame, Marinetti and Apollinaire. And lastly, we looked at music notation. And as I mentioned before, Paul writes in a performance-based way. That is, word as sound, sound as performance. So we felt that it was important to look at musical notation and see how sound is represented and conveyed on the printed page. You can see on the left here is a fairly traditional and straightforward way of, of writing music notation. What we became more interested in was the more avant-garde and experimental composers who use notation in a different way. People like John Cage and Karl Heinz Stockhausen, for example. This work can be read and played, but there is an element of ambiguity and therefore interpretation required here. Dare I say that if this was given to five different musicians to play, no two would sound the same. So signature. So with all this in mind, I set about creating the designs for the book. As I've mentioned, Paul's writing is dense and multi-layered. The design needed to be the same, but somehow appears simple and legible enough to read, but still visually engaging and unique. So this page shows the four main elements that I was going to create the entire book with. Two typefaces were chosen, Baskerville and Accidents Grotesque, a serif and a sans serif. This would allow me the freedom to create two different voices within the text. Baskerville is known as a tra transition font. That is a font between the old style and the modern fonts in the sort of serif history. It's also an English font and Paul, the author is English and he kind of transitioned from England to Australia. And this, this typeface was purposely designed by John Baskerville in 1750 for better legibility in book designs. Interesting to note that Baskerville was designed just before colonization of, of Australia in 1788. So this typeface seemed incredibly appropriate on various levels. Accidents Grotesque was chosen as the opposite of Baskerville. We wanted the book to be a modern contemporary book, one that was designed in the present, but had one eye on the past and one eye on the future. So accidents allowed us to play with the idea of modernity and diversity. Now you also notice the circle and the diamond. So I felt I needed to have some form of device that I could play with, especially after looking at how difficult it was to read Paul Scriptio Continua. I, ne I needed to be able to add some interpunks to the text to make it more legible. And just remember again, an interpunct is simply a word spacer. So I chose these two shapes for their ambiguity. 
they simultaneously have meaning in both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous worlds. So they are filled with meaning. The circle and diamond are motifs synonymous with Indigenous painting and therefore Indigenous communication. But they also have connotations with non-Indigenous cultures in the languages of geometry, mathematics, computing and writing. Remember the quill formed calligraphy from the illuminated manuscripts? The tittle or the circle that sits on top of the I or a J when written in the calligraphic hand becomes a diamond. So both these shapes could be used am ambiguously throughout the book. That is, they represent many things, but never only one thing. So I, the other element was to play with the book was I had a color palette and I chose these colors on as the other element to play with. If the poems are about the site's history, stories and voices, the colors could perhaps imbue the Australian landscape. So with all of these elements, I began to construct the book. With the cover, we didn't want to give away any idea of what the book would be or what was inside. We simply stated the title and the author's name. An interesting note is the word signature. It's made up of two words, sign and nature, which when you sort of discover it, it gives a little clue to the contents, sign, nature, signature. The book itself is linen covered with debossed and foiled text. The page edging is sprayed a matte black, and it was important that the book for us had a sense of materiality, something that was beautiful to hold and feel, something that felt considered, but something that still felt a little bit mysterious. So the first poem you come across is a poem called Tracks. Now, just before I get into the into the nitty gritties of it all, I just want to give you a little bit about the structure of the book. So each section of the book is made up of three parts. There's an intro page, which is what you're looking at here, a title page and the actual poems. The intro page is where Paul shares a little bit of context about the poem, the where, the how, the why he conceived the poems, which you can see on the left hand page. It, it also contains the title of the series, in this case, Tracks and the names of the subsets of poems. So in this case, Trax is made up of four poems, air, earth, water, and fire. Paul often writes poems in sets uh, and they're often and composed as a series of poems. We decided to give each poem its own title page. This would help with the reading of the book, but also give the readers a chance to take a little breather from the dense writing. So these title pages vary throughout the book and are designed like concrete poems. They visually help tie the sets of poems together. And in this way, we can show they are connected but are separate at the same time. In this case, for tracks, these are the four title, page, uh, title pages for tracks. The design hinged on the idea of the circle as an identifier for space. And the typography shows the four elements interacting in and around that space. So the first set of poems are called tracks. And we wanted to start the book off fairly straightforward. That is, we didn't want to reveal all our ideas first up. It was important to think of the whole book as a long piece of music, one that starts slowly and gradually builds up a rhythm with different movements and changes as you progress through the book. So this starting poem was intentionally quite conservative. You can see the introduction of the scriptio continua and the introduction of the circle as the interpunks. As a word spacer, this reiterates its representation as space from the title page and the diamonds denoting line breaks. The next poem is called Zip Code. And as you can see, this too is made up of four poems, again, titled Air, Earth, Water and Fire. And here are the four concrete poem title pages for Zip Code. Again, these show a similarity but, diff but difference in their layouts, each acting as a playful signature of the poem to come. So here we introduce Baskerville into the poem, the scriptio continua, the interpunks, which are now turned from circles to diamonds, which act as the space, and now the rubrics. This is also the first introduction of our poetic notation. Remember the ideas explored in the music notation pages. Here the notation serves as a multitude of information and can be read in many ways. So for example, 
Line breaks are depicted here with a double line and breath patterns a single line and they're notated to assist in the reading of the text. Whereas stress letters, which is the letter with the open circle above it, and the glissando, which is the line connecting lines above or below the words, they assist with the sound performance. So just to let you know, a stress letter when said aloud will be higher in pitch, longer in duration, and generally a little louder than unstressed syllables. And a glissando is a continuous slide upwards or downwards between two notes. These notation guides assist both the reading of the written word and the sound performance, the silent isolated reading and the audible performance for an audience. So following on from zip code is Niram New, which you might remember from the early slides I showed at Federation Square, the ones that were etched into the sandstone. These poems are longer and more complex than zip code and, there's more, and, and are more plentiful. There's actually nine of these in total. On the right-hand side, the intro page consists of a field, which is made up of the title typographically, and is also punctuated by a larger title indicating the history of the site breaking through. So much of this book is about time and history, and time is connected to space. So for the left-hand pages, it made sense to introduce the diamond form, which you'll see is used in the poems as a spacer to connect with the idea of time. For each poem, the diamond here operates as a clock, turning with, with each intro page to indicate the passage of time. These title pages visually and poetically read as one space over time with multiple histories. These poems consist of multiple voices talking and connecting to each other. So I was able to denote these different voices by using different colored rubrics. You can also see the overall effect of the notation system in these poems. I've also included here a slide of what some of our markup pages look like. After designing the notation system, the poems went back to Paul for him to mark up before I relayed these changes into the final designs. The next poem is Relay, which was written for the Olympic Games. And these poems play with the idea of a baton being passed from one runner to the next. For the title pages here, I took a different approach. The names of the poems were named after the colors from the Olympic rings. So I wanted to fill the pages here with a big slab of color, a bit like a color field painting. This is color as poetry. And I wanted here to make a considered bold insertion as an intentional break from the intricacy of the previous poems. In the case of the poems, in, in the case of the poems, the last letter of a, word, of a word often made up the first letter of the next word. This makes the poems full of multiple readings. So there's actually poems within poems. I, uh, braces, which are the curly brackets, I introduced as these indicated the passing of a letter. So each set, of work, each set of works here consisted of five poems, making 20 in total. Each section of the poems starts more dense than the last and therefore enabled the typography to increase in size as the poems progressed. Again, the materiality of the book comes into play with the decision being made to run the poems vertically. It means the reader has to physically engage with the book by turning the book to read. And that's also a nod to the physicality of the runners and the athletes competing at the games. So Golden Grove is the next poem, and these poems were based around the star constellation known as the Pleiades. The intro and title pages here use the position of the constellation as the layout device. In the title pages, the constellation is color coded. So to show you where you are, where you've been and where you're going. And again, this reiterates notions of past, present, and future. As a nod to the ancient Greeks who named the constellation, these poems were set in straight scriptio continua. Next up is a poem called Alterations. And these poems are written as if the stones of the area are speaking about the heard and unheard voices from market day. It's as if, Voices were a bustle of sound coming from all directions. They are written as half-remembered nursery rhymes. The poems are scattered randomly across the page, 
reiterating the nature of the voices coming from all directions in the marketplace. Now, Paul wrote these texts in a copybook cursive writing uh, he learned as a child, and the design follows this idea of learning to write motif indicated by the positioning of the coloured bands behind the words. The challenge here was to make the randomness of these poems still legible, and this was achieved through the use of scale, font and colour. So next up is a poem called Rival Channels, and this poem is about the river's sense of place and its connection to past, present and future. The words here are spoken by a bird, the Lewin's rail, which is a species of water edge dwelling bird whose presence is recognized as a healthy ecosystem. The rail is hardly seen and has a haunting call, a metaphor for spirit of place. The bird dwells in the reeds of the river's edge and the poems reiterate this with the poems reading in a vertical manner. The bird is colored brown, black and red, indicated here with the rubrics. The poem is staged as though the bird is glimpsed through the reeds and throughout this series, each poem is situated in a different part of the page, akin to the movement of the reeds blowing in the wind. And so we come to the last poem and the last poem is called Mystic Edge. And it's one that embraces the idea of indigenous and non-indigenous peoples of Australia moving into a future together. Australia's past has been a tumultuous one especially with the treatment of our Indigenous people with colonisation. But this poem hopes for a shared future. The two languages of the Indigenous and non-Indigenous are connected, and so the circle and diamond, which have been used in isolation throughout the book, have come together for the first time. These two languages now hinge off each other in an act of reconciliation and unity and represent a hopeful future moving forward together. Now, Paul wrote this poem as a welcome to country in terms a child could understand. Working with an Indigenous elder, it was tr translated into the Nyunga language. Afterwards, the elder told Paul he'd incorporated some of these poems into his own welcome to country. And so the last page in the book is the reiteration of this hopeful future together with the two symbols sitting side by side in harmony. And it is here that the stories of the future have not been written yet. So to conclude, I know this has probably been a lot to take in in 20 minutes, but I hope this has given you some idea and insights into the thinking of how we put this book together and why certain decisions were made. Uh, not every job affords me the freedom to work at this level, and I'm so glad that I've been able to share this with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was fantastic. Uh, those markups from Paul looked mind blowing, but beautiful in their own right. Yes, um, they are. <laughs> you'll have to frame those ones. Um, you talked about the the last poem being uh, written as a welcome to country. I'd love for you to share uh, for the rest of the world, for those outside of Australia, what what that is and what that means. Yeah, so a, a welcome to country is a ceremony that's performed by the uh, by Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island Strait Islander elders uh, or traditional owners who have been given permission, basically to welcome uh, visitors on into the traditional land. Uh, you know, give them safe passage. Uh, it, it's a, it's a really important uh, ceremony, uh, and you know, like I said, with with. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians trying to actually move together forward now in a, in a positive way, um, not forgetting the past, but, you know, um, moving forward, uh, these ceremonies are, are a very, very important way of doing, doing getting the Indigenous voice heard. Mm -hmm. Thank mm. you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, mm. <clears throat> it seems like Signature in itself was such a huge undertaking. Was that your COVID project? Well, it sort of happened before. I mean, Signature itself took three and a half years to design. So, and, and, and that's also because, you know, there's a lot of work with working with Paul. It, it wasn't sort of like he just handed me the text. We, we had meeting after meeting after meeting and, and sat down and did workshops and worked through ideas on how we could do this. These, these poems of Paul's have been written over like a 20 year period. So, it was a matter of finding which poems uh, we wanted to use and how we could put them together. 
because the poems themselves are written as uh, they're written for site specific works. So to sort of bring them all together and create a sort of narrative or story arc through those poems and through the stories uh, takes a lot of time. And also I'd have to say from, from a designing point of view, you know, every interpunct in that whole book, I had to be placed by hand. Every rubric had to be coloured by hand. Every bit of music notation had to be put in individually. So some pages had something like 200 elements to play with. Um, and if Paul made an, then a text change, <laughs> it, was back, it was back to the start, basically. <laughs> Sounds like a mammoth task, like your uh, very own manuscript. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can see the reference to that as well. <laughs> um, I've got an attendee uh, that's asking, could you share how you created the note system for the type? Does that make sense? The notes, like the notation system? Yeah, I think so. Well, I think I think with, with the notation system, that was, again, it was about sound. Um, uh, sound and uh, and the, the the act of reading, so silence and noise in a way. And I think you know what I was saying before was is that uh, really we looked at music notation. Um, we didn't want it to be uh, we didn't want it to be music notation. It had to be something else. Mm -hmm. um, and this is again, you know, Paul is so knowledgeable in terms of the history of poetry. Um, so he taught me a, a, an incredible amount um, and things like, you know, uh, uh, I guess things, you know, like, like breath patterns, I didn't even think of, but he writes in a way in which he considers where you draw a breath, where a word is said louder. So pulling from music notation and pulling from what it is that we wanted to say, it was then sort of, uh, sort of, cross-pollination of those two things great mm. awesome well thanks so much for joining us sean that that was really great oh look thank you and i've got to say the presentations today were fantastic to watch really inspiring um thank you troy as well very much so you're welcome Okay, so I hope everyone enjoyed today's speakers from uh, the South Pacific. It was a pleasure um, bringing them to you. And I'll now hand it uh, back to you, Barbara. Uh, thanks so much, Troy, and to our wonderful speakers for this uh, engaging session. Um, please join us next Tuesday for day five, curated by Ilya Ruderman as we journey to Russia. And I hope you'll come to the rest of the sessions in the following weeks. Check our website for the schedule. So good morning, afternoon, night, evening. Thanks so much.